I guess at some point we should get it on the record. How many types of airplanes have you flown? That was an interesting question to me. I think it was about five years ago. Air and Space Smithsonian Magazine uh, told me that they were going to put me on the cover. And this was, like I say, about five, five years ago or so. And it was a real honor because they said, you're only the third person that we will have put on our cover of Air and Space Magazine. And they said, okay, for the website, we're going to put a website together and all. Um, how, many, how many different airplanes have you flown? We want to put that on the website. And I said, well, I, I don't know. I've never sat down to count it. And they said, well, then make us a list. So I made a list, and this was some years ago. But anyway, to answer your question, I've kept the list updated ever since then. And the answer is 162 airplanes or helicopters or gliders um, all together. 162 uh, is the number at this point. Do you consider the shuttle an airplane? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Absolutely. And so now I've listed... I've listed the four shuttles. I suppose I could just say, okay, the space shuttle. But I wanted to make the number look bigger. So I said, okay, space shuttle Challenger, space shuttle Columbia, space shuttle Atlantis, and space shuttle Endeavour. Well, they were all different models. They, well, they were all different modifications. There were differences. They were slightly different each time you flew them. So I, so I took credit for the space shuttle four times. Maybe that's being greedy, but uh, that's what I did. Some of us are old enough to remember that in the early stages when the, when the space shuttle program was in development, um, there were people who said, I know what that is. That's military. That's, that's some way to militarize space. Um, and the fact is the shuttle program, uh, I have no idea. I should, but I don't. How many different human disciplines that advanced, uh, including, you know, weapons, but, but also, uh, I mean, the fly five missions. Can you talk about five different objectives and, and well, you, 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 you brought up military. The shuttle very definitely has military applications, things that it can do. Anything that occupies the high ground like that can be used for surveillance, can be used for Intelligence gathering can be used for many, many things. And, and let's face it, we know we have military satellites up there. However, there is an international treaty that says we will not weaponize space. And we have lived by that faithfully. I don't know if other people have necessarily done that. In other words, you won't base weapons in space. And we have never done that. And I have been part of a military mission aboard the space shuttle, but to describe the five missions which you asked about, my first flight was aboard Challenger, and we carried two communication satellites, civilian communication satellites, and we planned and did do the very first untethered spacewalks ever done. Every time that we would send astronauts outside a spacecraft, they needed to be very carefully tethered to the spacecraft in case they pushed the wrong way and floated away. And a vehicle like the space station, you're not going to be able to maneuver it to go pick them up. Now that came along years later. We could maneuver the space shuttle, so we had the capability to rec rescue a, a marooned astronaut that had pushed away. But we did the very first test flights of the manned maneuvering unit or the Buck Rogers Jet Backpack, as it was affectionately known. And Bruce McCandless was the first human ever to set foot outside a spaceship without being tethered to it. And he flew the man maneuvering unit the length of a football field away from the shuttle. <laughs> and some intestinal fortitude and, to be the first guy to do that. And equally as important to him, back to the space shuttle. <laughs> And, Maybe more. <laughs> but, I, but I will add that we trained to rescue him if we needed to. So we had a procedure in place called EVA Crew Member Rescue, EVA standing for Extravehicular Activity. So we had the capability to fly over and rescue him if need be. And no doubt you've seen the photo of an astronaut floating in space away from the shuttle on an angle. I was the photographer 
that took all of those photos because there were only three of us left inside Challenger because we were only a five-person crew and we sent two of our mission specialists outside to do the spacewalk. So Bruce McCandless and Bob Stewart were the first two ever to fly free in space. So we did that. We also came back and made the very first landing at, back at Cape Canaveral. And that was the 10th launch of a shuttle back in 1984. I, I want to just interrupt you for a second. Um, you know, pilots think about touch and goes and practicing landings, and there's no way to practice a shuttle landing except a simulator. I mean, what <clears throat> what were you thinking about on final, <laughs> on your first uh, flight? We had trained so extensively for the landing, and we have an excellent, excellent space shuttle landing simulator. Now, we had the, the motion-based simulator, which is in a building. We had the fixed-based simulator, and we could, we could fly landings in there because we had a visual scene as well. And it's, it's being realized in many ways that you don't really need a motion base if you have a big enough visual visual scene because you go into a roll and you see the horizon roll and you feel like you're rolling your 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 brain fills in the scene to tell you yes i'm in a roll angle but we had even better than that we had a modified grumman gulfstream 2 that had been modified to fly just exactly like the space shuttle flew so it had a digital computer mounted in the middle of the cabin basically and it had thrust reversers that we could engage in flight. And that's what it took to get the kind of drag that a space shuttle has. Because the Gulfstream II is a really clean, sleek, high-performance airplane. And the space shuttle is kind of like a flying dump truck. It's got a, <laughs> it's got a lot of drag. And so it makes this very steep approach into land. And... To model that, what had to be done was uh, the, the Gulfstream, the G2, Gulfstream 2, the flaps had to be removed and replaced with plane flaps uh, because they were triple-slotted Fowler flaps is what they were. What we needed, though, was we needed flaps that could go up to kill lift as well as down to add lift when you needed it to model the deck angle of the space shuttle. So that was one of the specifications that had to be matched was when we're touching down, we would be at 10 degrees angle of attack was our, was our angle of attack for touchdown speed. And we needed to be able to model that with the Gulfstream. And so it needed to be killing lift as we're touching down because the wing of that airplane had way too much lift. So there were some significant modifications. The left cockpit in the front cockpit, of course, was configured to be just like the space shuttle cockpit. So we had a space shuttle attitude indicator, space shuttle instruments. We had a space shuttle heads-up display that we looked through. Now, one of the amusing things is that the space shuttle has fairly large windows, but they're far enough away from you that the angular field of view of the Gulfstream II was too big. So we had to put in plastic masking to block part of our field of view out the forward windscreen and also out of the two side windows. We had to make it smaller so because we had to adapt to that because the, the approach and landing is visual. And now you're looking at your displays inside as well, but it's out the window. And so you're going to land looking out the window through the heads-up display. We fly that airplane, and before a person would make his or her first flight as shuttle co-pilot, they would have had about 500 approaches in this Grumman Gulfstream. So most of the time we took it out to White Sands, New Mexico, and flew it to the Northrop Strip that's there, which is about a 20,000-foot runway on the dry lake bed up there at, at uh, White Sands. And we would go up to 38,000 feet for the very first approach and fly it all the way down, which didn't take very long. And then it takes 
doesn't take very much time to come down, but it takes a long time to get back up. So you generally would just make one high approach on the first one. And then after that, we would go back up to about, I want to say about 15,000 feet above the ground and engage the simulation mode and fly it the rest of the way down from there. Now at space shuttle touchdown, the landing gear of the Gulfstream 2 would be, if I remember right, about 30 feet above the ground because your eye height in the in the space shuttle was so high because you're at a 10 degree angle of attack and it's such a big vehicle and your main gear is way down below you and you're going to touch down on the main gear first and that's where the simulation would end it would automatically when we would get to simulated touchdown height we were after less than three feet per second descent rate is what we were after and 205 knots touchdown speed so about 235 miles per hour touchdown speed that's what you were trying to achieve and it was an interesting airplane to fly because it's a hundred ton glider it doesn't fly like any other airplane it flies like a space shuttle so it took a lot of getting used to before a person would fly his or her first mission as commander they would probably have a thousand practice landings and the reason we train so heavily for it is obvious. You can't go into holding. You can't do a touch and go. You're not going to get a second try. You get exactly 1.0 attempts to land the thing. And so you don't dare get behind it. You don't dare get confused. And so we had to make sure that our commanders and co-pilots, pilots, were so highly trained that they could pull this off on the one chance you're going to get. I got to know on the, when you land the space shuttle, does somebody say three green when the, when the gear goes down? Yes, we do. Yeah. Yes, we do. And and what we did was the landing gear is not hydraulically deployed. The landing gear is sort of hydraulically deployed, but what happens is the uplocks that lock the landing gear up are just hydraulically released. The landing gear falls due to its own weight and also air loads, also air loads, because all three of the landing gear, when they extend, they extend aft into the airstream. So the velocity helps push the gear down. We wait until we are 300 feet above touchdown to deploy the landing gear. Is that system more fail safe than a hydraulic system that the gear's going to come down because gravity's going to drop it. It was a weight saving, I'm sure, to not have a hydraulic actuator to push all three of the gear down. Because every, every pound of weight that you take into orbit costs nine pounds of fuel. For every one pound that makes it to orbit, you burn nine pounds of fuel. And that's what the shuttle burned. And the shuttle was one of the more efficient vehicles in terms of, of payload weight, versus amount of fuel burned. But nine pounds of fuel for every one pound that you establish into orbit. So it was a, I'm sure it was a weight saving. Now, if your hydraulic system number one was failed, that's the one that releases the uplocks. And so there was a pyrotechnic system as a backup. And what we would do was we would it took two buttons. There wasn't a gear handle like we're all accustomed to on the space shuttle. There were two push buttons. One was called landing gear arm. The other one was called landing gear deploy. And we would arm the landing gear when we rolled out on final, basically. And then we wouldn't push the button, though, until we're at 300 feet above touchdown. And the reason is the space shuttle glides like kind of a smooth rock with the gear up. And it glides like a very bumpy rock with the gear down. So we would keep the gear retracted until 300 feet, and then we'd hit the deploy push button. Usually your mission specialist would be watching the three gear indicators and would say gear indicates down when they, when they reach the, the, the down position. And I was asked one time, what are you going to do if the gear doesn't come down? And I said, we have decided ahead of time we're going to land anyway. 
<laughs> As if we had a choice. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you didn't have a, what do they call it, a Jado pack in the back that you right. could somehow yeah, give yourself a boost of power? There's and, no touch and goes and no go around or anything. So you, you had to make sure you were on time for all of this. And the gear had, had plenty enough time because at 300 feet, we aren't coming down like we are when we're at 10,000 feet. We are, we are on a one and a half degree glide slope at that point. So we're a very shallow flight path angle. And so there's plenty enough time for the gear to make it down as long as you push that button on time. The incredible training. I mean, I, not only the equipment, but what you guys went through and how well prepared you were. Uh, were there any surprises the first time you actually flew? Anything that, that deviated from the training you had done? or the, the answer is no. There was no difference between it and the sh what we called the shuttle training airplane, the STA, was that modified Gr Grumman Gulfstream II. And it was remarkable. Every time a commander came back from his or her first landing that they made, and so my first landing was on my second mission, in the debrief, they would say, okay, talk about it related to the STA, the shuttle training airplane. And the answer was always, don't change a thing. It flies just like the STA does. So we were so very well trained to, to actually land the space shuttle because it, it flew just like our STA. <clears throat> what about the reentry? The, the, the heat of the reentry? I mean, there's no way to simulate that. Uh, before you actually go through it, is there? We could sort of simulate it in the in the motion based simulator and the the fixed based simulator because we had the television screens for the out the window view. And what they would do is they would start out in a a, a dull pinkish color, and then it would get brighter and brighter and brighter, and finally it's just about bright as day out there for for the reentry. And I remember. I remember for my first mission. I got to ask a stupid question. Are you at some point like on fire? Are you surrounded by by flame or for 15 minutes? Yes, you are. Because what happens? What happens during the reentry? We hit the top of the atmosphere, which is about 80 nautical nautical miles up, 400,000 feet is where we have defined the top of the atmosphere. Now, actually prior to that on your way down after having performed the deorbit burn, which slows you down and puts you on a trajectory that's going to intercept Earth's air. And it's really the drag of the air that slows us down the rest of the way, because we only have enough fuel to slow down about 300 miles an hour. But that's enough to, to change our trajectory to where we hit the air. And the flight path angle when we hit the air has to be one half degree down, one half a degree. If it's less than that, you're going to tend to skip out. You're not going to encounter enough air to get the drag, and you're going to sail by your landing site at 200,000 feet. If it's steeper than that, you're going to burn up because the thermal protection system on the orbiter, which the orbiter, by the way, is made out of aluminum, that's not going to tolerate more than about 300 degrees. We're going to see 9,000. So what happens is we create a shock wave in the air because we're 25 times the speed of sound, Mach 25. And it's cool. When you've, once you've flown your first flight, you qualify for this very exclusive little patch. It's a pretty small uh, rectangular patch. has a picture of a shuttle on it, and it says Mach 25. That means you have flown Mach 25. And... It's a, it's a thrill to have that patch, to have that thing. But at Mach 25, you create this enormous, powerful shock wave around the vehicle. And the temperature in it, I used to know the formula to calculate it from my aeronautical engineering, but it has to do with the square of the Mach number. So, for example, at Mach 3, you'd square 3, you get 9. At Mach 25, you square that, you get 625. So the... Temperature is proportional to the square of the Mach number, and so at Mach 25, what we get is 9,000 degrees. And that temperature 
starts out as a dull pinkish kind of glow even before we get all the way down to 400,000 feet and then it gets brighter and brighter and brighter and finally it's just as bright as day out the window and you have that fire and flame around you now it's actually a plasma it isn't really fire it's a plasma we heat the outside air up so hot that we cause the molecules of oxygen which is O2 to dissociate to break up into O and O and nitrogen which is N2 to break up into N and N, N, N and so that results in a net electrical charge and I don't know if it's positive or negative I don't remember whether it's positive or negative but you have this charged cloud of plasma around you and that's why you can't broadcast or receive radio signals through it is because it has a it has a charge so that causes blackout what was known as blackout during re-entry now I actually flew the world's first re-entry that didn't have a blackout but that's but that's another story but you are surrounded by fire and flame for about 15 minutes on your way down to land when we are really slow all the way down to just Mach 10 that's where <laughs> slow all the way down to Mach 10. You're yawning. That's yeah. where the fire starts. Awake. Yes, <laughs> that's where the fire starts to dissipate. But one of the things that you really noticed in the simulator, especially the motion based simulator, was wow, the launch is really dynamic and the launch only takes eight and a half minutes. And all of a sudden, you are at orbital speed in just eight and a half minutes. So that's a pretty exciting dynamic ride. Re entry in the simulator seems pretty tame because you do the deorbit burn an hour before touchdown and then we free fall for 30 minutes we're still at zero G's free fall for 30 minutes until we hit the top of that atmosphere and now you just feel this very slow build up in G because there's just a little bit of drag when you first get there. The top of the atmosphere is what altitude? We, we define it as about 400,000 feet. Okay. So it's about 80 nautical miles. And what's fun is you say, I think, I think we're feeling a little bit of G coming on, aren't we? We're already seeing it, the glow, out the windows. And, and you'd take your pencil and you'd let your pencil go and it would just very slowly head towards the floor. And you'd say, yeah, we're getting a little bit of G. And uh, then, then as you got into thicker and thicker air, of course, the Gs build up. And we build up to a total of two Gs during the reentry. So the constant drag phase, when we get to that, and constant drag is something like Mach 14 down to about Mach 10, pick a number, something like that. Mach 14 down to about Mach 10. That's where we are right at two G's of total total G uh, during the course of it. So that's as much G as we are supposed to see during re-entry. And I don't think anyone, I saw a G spike on my third mission where we went above two G's, just a little bit above two G's. But that was an abnormality. And uh, so, um, however, once you've flown your first re-entry, you say, okay, it isn't just a, a dull, boring glide back to land because the amount of plasma is what's around you. It isn't fire and flame. By breaking up all the molecules like that, you form a 9,000 degree plasma around the vehicle is what, uh, is what gives you the light show. Is there any sense of relief or when that time period comes to an end, when you actually know that you're there or you have not burned up? And I mean, do you, is, is, or... Are you just trained to not think about that stuff? The answer is yes. There's a little bit of a relief because you are, like I say, surrounded by this fire for 15 minutes. And every so often, looking out your windscreen, you'd see some sparks go by. And you'd say, what was that? Did we just lose a tile? And is that what's making sparks that went by? And so when you started to dissipate the fire and flame at Mach 10, Yes, there was a little bit of relief because you said, okay, we have survived the high heating region. Uh, now, we still have plenty to go. We still have a long ways to go to get, get safely on the runway. But there is a, there is a feeling that, okay, we have, we have weathered the, uh, the thermal region. And as I recall, 
in the very early stages of developing the space shuttle, weren't the, the tiles, the, the, uh, f the heat shield tiles, a, a, a drawback or, or a delay trying to get those right? I mean, they've, they've been an issue for a long time, right? That was one of the big delays. The, uh, the two big delays getting ready for first launch of the space shuttle, uh, as you point out, one of them was the tile system. And this was the first time that anything like this had been used because we needed a reusable insulation system. We needed a reusable thermal protection system. So that's what they're referred to as TPS tiles, thermal protection system tiles. And they are silica, which I guess sand is silica. So it's a, it's a type of silica and to hold a tile in your hand, it feels like you're holding a block of styrofoam. So that's about how, how heavy it is. So in other words, it's very lightweight. So that's a big advantage, but it's also very capable. The tiles themselves can handle temperatures up to about 2,400 degrees. And what happens during reentry is this big shock wave that we were talking about that has a 9,000 degree temperature in it, the shock wave is actually separated away from the space shuttle by a, by a certain distance. And that's why the space shuttle is so blunt, because you want to produce a very, very powerful shock wave, while a very powerful shock wave is a thick shock wave. So 9,000 degrees is that much farther away from the surface of the orbiter, because the tiles, Tiles are really, really very good at, at dissipating heat, and, but they can only tolerate about 2,400 degrees. So for the areas that see 3,000 degrees, the gray nose cap, the gray wing leading edges will see 3,000 degrees. Those are made of reinforced carbon carbon, or you know, in NASA lingo, RCC, reinforced carbon carbon. And we had a lot of trouble originally with the tile system on Columbia. And I'm sure many of us may remember how when we dispatched Columbia from Palmdale, where it was being assembled, and flew it down to Cape Canaveral to continue the work with the tiles down there, a number of the tiles that had been already applied and already placed on the underside of the shuttle came off during the trip. And that's only seeing air that's going, what, 450 miles an hour or something like that. It's going to see air moving past it much faster than that during launch. <laughs> so obviously we needed to refine the attachment system much better. And what they came up with, if I remember it right, was they, they came up with a pull test that they would go ahead and bond the tiles to a, a SIP, an SIP, a strain isolation pad, which was similar to a felt pad, and the tiles were, were glued, essentially, with RTV to those, and the pad allowed the tile to expand when it got hot. And you had to have space, a certain space, in between all the tiles, and then you had to have Nomex rope gap fillers in between all the tiles. So it was a big nightmare to originally get the tiles mounted and uh, correctly glued in place and pull tested successfully. That was one of the big technology areas of the shuttle. Once we got those working, once we got those in place and in place correctly, they worked very well. You would always have some tiles damaged on a flight, whether from rocks or whatever being thrown up by the wheels on landing, you would chip some tiles. And so you always had tiles that had to be replaced. But they all had an individual serial number. Each tile? Each tile had its own serial number so that if you had to replace one, you could go to the inventory and say, okay, we need a whatever the numbering system was. We need one of those. And initially, I think there were 30,000 tiles. And that included the black tiles that went on the bottom. That's the real high heat region. And then the white tiles that were on the top. Now, over the years, we started to replace the white tiles, the ones on the top and on the rocket pods back on the back of the shuttle. Got to replacing a lot of those with thermal blankets, so probably Nomex blankets. And 
I'm, I don't remember exactly. I want to say it's something like a thousand degrees. The uh, thermal blankets are good for. So areas that are only, only going to see a thousand degrees during reentry uh, could replace all the tiles in that area with one thermal blanket. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.